1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 27 through 36 as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study here in the book of 1 Samuel. So let's begin reading in 1 Samuel chapter 2 at verse 27. We'll read to verse 36 and get into our study. 1 Samuel chapter 2 beginning at verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the Lord, rather to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will, be, there will not be an old man in your house, and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. And one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. So we have a very cheery Bible study this morning that we're going to be enjoying together. We're going to be looking at how the Lord deals with sin. We know that as we've gone through 1 Samuel We've been introduced to a man by the name of Eli. Eli served as what would be called in the nation of Israel a high priest. And Eli, as a high priest, had sons who were also priests. And they, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, are spoken of in verse 12 here in chapter 2 as being corrupt and not knowing the Lord. And as I was mentioning last time we were together, when he says they were corrupt, it's another way of saying they're unsaved. These are people who would literally be called sons of the devil or sons of Belial. And so Eli, though a godly man, has two ungodly sons. They have no knowledge of God. And these men with no knowledge of God also have no fear of God. And I mentioned to you that when somebody doesn't have a fear of God, then they're willing to sin without concern for any repercussions. When people have no fear of God, they're willing to do whatever, and they don't really care. They don't care if they're in the tabernacle like these men were. They don't care if they're there robbing God, robbing the people, bullying them, causing them not to care about God. They didn't care that they were sleeping with the women who were there trying to serve the Lord. It didn't matter to them at all because when you have no fear of God, you're willing to do anything because you're not afraid of consequences. And, and today we have a lot of people with no fear of God within them at all. I mean, here in this church, we've had to deal with things that are uh, unbelievable, really. I mean, here we have to have people walking through the parking lot to protect your vehicles while you're serving the Lord here when you're here to uh, receive the Word of God. We have security that walk around because they have to because there have been times uh, in the history of this church that people's cars have been broken into, radios have been stolen, cars themselves have been taken off the parking lot. That should cause you to be a little nervous about right now, right? Man, I hope it's my car. I hope it's my car. Uh, we've lost cars here. There's no doubt about that. We've seen that. You know, when we finished building the, um, the children's wing over there, and it hadn't been opened uh, more than a very short time, maybe a week or two, three weeks at the most, some kids decided that the best thing that they could do to 
to show how much they respected church property was to, to take out uh, some kind of um, sharp tool and to write their name all over the mirrors and things like that. So they tagged in there and you go into a brand new place and they've already put their names and things like that. As a matter of fact, they did it all over the place here. We, uh, if you look at the chapel and you look at the west side and if you were to look at that area there on the west side there on the, um, on the southern section, you'll see that there is a, a big window there with a big old decal on it. And uh, you may wonder, why do we have that? We have that because these kids had written all over the glass there. So rather than us spending the kind of money that it would take to replace that glass, we simply put a decal over it just to hide it. We had to do that because people came onto the church grounds and decided that the best thing they could do was uh, right all over the all over the windows and 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 uh, just do acts of vandalism. Uh, a few weeks ago, on a Saturday night, we had a Saturday night service, and um, some people came on the grounds and stole palm trees. They dug palm trees out of the ground and dragged them across. We saw the dirt, you know, from where they stole the palm trees and they dragged the dirt, dragged it and left the dirt trail and stole palm trees from the church on a Saturday night. I called Roll and I said, listen man, if you needed a palm tree, you should have asked me. We'd have given it to you. But no, he's got to come and steal it, I'll tell you. A thing that blew my mind is recently we did inventory and in our bookstore and, and uh, we discovered that we have a shrinkage of about 8%, which means that uh, taken into consider consideration that perhaps there's some uh, just some receiving perhaps some paperwork problems and and that's not accurate it means that people are coming into the Christian bookstore and stealing they steal things and we know that they do that I mean we've, we, we've seen that but the thing that blew my mind the most is somebody actually came into the church and took a $90 Bible it had Morocco leather and this and that they took a $90 Bible put it in a $24 case you know, so they took it to the, and they bought a $90 Bible for $24. And I thought, man, you ought to read Exodus chapter 20. It says, thou shalt not steal there. You know, but no, they probably ripped it out and rolled up a cigarette. I don't know. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that's the way it is. You know, and, and, and really, realistically, listen, if anybody here needs a Bible, please don't steal one. I'll give you one. I'll, I'll give you a Bible. Because it's just not what you should do. You shouldn't do that. But when you have no fear of God, when you, when it, 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 it will not bother you at all to do those kinds of things. It, it won't bother you. And these men did not have a fear of God. And because they didn't have a fear of God, they're, they're referred to as being corrupt. They don't know the Lord. They don't have a fear of God at all. That's why they're willing to steal God's sacrifice. That's why they bully the people and cause them to abhor the sacrifice of the Lord. People didn't even want to come to Shiloh anymore to, to make their offerings because of the way that these two men, Hophni and Phinehas, were acting. And as a result of that, the Lord is going to now deal with them. Now Eli tried to reprove his sons for the things that they were doing. But by now he's an old man. And his sons are rejecting what he has to say. Their hearts have been hardened in their sin. They have gotten to the point of being beyond repentance. And so God now is going to deal with them. He's going to bring judgment upon them all. Notice verse 27, how it says, A man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus saith the Lord. God has made a determination to bring judgment on Eli and his sons. But before he does that, he sends a message to him through a man of God. The phrase man of God is the title of a prophet. You see that phrase, the man of God used in the book of Judges, here in First and Second Samuel, as well as in First and Second Kings. So it speaks about him sending a prophet. So God sends his prophet to speak to Eli because he's going to prepare him for what is about to take place. God has been waiting for some time to deal with this. And his patience has now reached its end. God's mercy is often expressed in what, was, what is called his long-suffering because God gives men and women time to repent. God doesn't come down on us, in other words, the first time we sin, but he gives us opportunity, sometimes over months, weeks, even years, to finally say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. He's merciful in that way. The Bible makes it very clear in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God patiently has been waiting so that Eli and his sons would get it together. There's no doubt he didn't move quickly on them, though God has made a determination that he is going to deal with them. 
But the Bible makes it clear that, uh, that his long-suffering, the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. That's what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. So it would seem that, that the Lord has waited patiently for Eli's sons to repent. But now Eli is very old. Notice verse 22, how it says that. It says, Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did in all Israel, how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He heard because the rumors had come to him. The reports had finally reached his ears. I'm certain he was aware of it. Any father knows their sons. Any father knows the sons are capable of doing certain things. And this is more than likely simply validating and verifying what he pretty much knew about them already. He's very old. Now, last time we were together, I mentioned to you, according to chapter 4, verse 15, that Eli dies when he's 98 years old. And so when I was here speaking to you last time, I had said he was probably around 98 at the time. Actually, to correct myself, he's not 98 at this time. He's probably around 80 years of age at this time, and God is giving to them more time to repent. And there's a reason why I'll show you that, and I'll touch this very briefly. Notice verse... Um, verse uh, 21 here in the same chapter it, it speaks of the child Samuel and notice again verse 26 it speaks of the child Samuel and so that speaks to us concerning the fact that he's still very young in chapter 3 verse 1 it says the boy Samuel and so what you have is you have time that is going to be occurring in his life because by the time you get into chapter 3 verse 19 it says Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and that none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. All of that was going to take some time. So undoubtedly the Lord begins to minister in, in a very specific way when Eli's between 70 and 80 years old, but he's going to ultimately bring his final judgment on them when Eli becomes 98 years of age. The fact is, though, that they've been sinning terribly for some time, and God is acting, and he sends a prophet to speak to Eli in order to rebuke him. Notice it says in verse 27 again, um, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father? Now, this is something that he's been warned about, something that he's aware of. And so, if you don't act when you first become aware of something, what happens is the thing that you do not correct eventually becomes the thing that becomes part of their character and it becomes who they are. When our kids are small and they do certain things that are wrong, if we correct them quickly, we may be able to help them to see that that is wrong. But if I allow them to continue doing something, it becomes part of their habit, it becomes part of the way they are and ultimately becomes their character. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, uh, the writer said, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So we are supposed to act quickly to help people, our kids especially, to see that this is wrong. Well, that didn't happen. So over time, God had given them opportunity to repent. They refused to, and now he acts. Eli knew that God was displeased with what was happening. He did nothing to stop it. And years have passed, and now God sends a prophet to confront him. Notice what he says here in verse 27. He says, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire. So what he does is he reminds him of the history of how he has worked with his family. He goes all the way back to the time that the children of Israel were in bondage. And he speaks concerning the fact that he had actually intervened in their behalf and, and actually had set them free. He wants to remind him of how good he has been to all of Aaron's descendants and how he revealed himself while that nation was in bondage. Because while they were in Egypt, God had selected Aaron and his descendants to be priests. And you see this in the book of Exodus, chapters 28 and 29. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 9, it says, The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. 
And so God had established the priesthood with Aaron and his descendants. And so he's reminding him. And he's saying, listen, don't you remember there was a time when your family was in bondage in Egypt? That's what he's referring to when he says, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? You at one time were in bondage, but God has set you free and chosen you to serve him. That's what he's saying. There was a time when you were in bondage, when your whole lineage was in bondage in Aaron. And there was a time when you were there serving in, in bondage in Egypt with Pharaoh. Don't you remember that? And how that God, he's saying, how I delivered you and I gave you blessings to, to be able to serve me. I gave you an honor you didn't deserve. I gave you the ability to serve me. I, I saved you out of bondage and that's an honor. I gave to you the ability to serve me. That's an honor that you don't deserve and you don't care. Now that's a very powerful thing to say. I saved you out of bondage, but you don't care. I gave you an honor you didn't deserve, but it is a light thing with you. It doesn't matter to you. You see, God's desire for the nation of Israel was for them to be his own special people and, and this nation to serve God. In the book of Exodus, in chapter 19, verse 6, it says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. In other words, you're going to be both a kingdom and a nation. You're going to be a multitude of peoples connected together. Not a scattered and disorganized people, but a royal nation. You will have your own religious rights. You will live under your own laws. You will be subject in spiritual matters only to God. And in things civil, to every ordinance of man for God's sake. You were in bondage, but I have brought you out. You were at one time in bondage, but I gave you the privilege of serving me. You at one time were in bondage. I set you free. And you don't care. There are a lot of people who profess to be Christians that don't care. It doesn't matter to them, and I suspect that it's because they're still in bondage. Probably have convinced themselves that they are Christians, when in reality, they've never really experienced the joy of being set free from the bondage of sin. And so they don't understand, and so it means very little to them. I've seen it to be true where, where parents have a, a fantastic uh, experience with God, where, where a mom or a dad got saved in a, in a, a great way, in a glorious way, and, and, and God moved in a tremendous way and, and worked in their life. And, and they raised kids who could care less about Christ, who care less about church, who care less about serving God. It matters not to them. I've also seen people who at one time have professed faith in Christ who ultimately go back to the world because they never really were set free from the bondage. They remained in bondage. But God is speaking to him now and he's saying, listen, I called you and your family out of bondage so that you might serve me, that you might have the honor of serving me, and I've been good to you. Well, you know, believers at one time, before we got saved, were in bondage, but now we're, in, we're free in Jesus Christ. Jesus in, in John 8, 36 said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And God, when he came into our life, when we received Christ, God set us free, and he made us capable of serving him. In 1 Peter, in chapter 2, verse 9, the apostle says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are this generation. He's speaking to the church. We are called a royal priesthood because we read the word of God and we can make our spiritual offerings to God. We don't need to go through a mediator outside of Jesus Christ and we can come to him. The offerings have already been made. Jesus died on the cross for us. He already poured out his blood for us. He's already made the way accessible to us. We can now go to God boldly with confidence. We can take our needs to him, petition him and request of him because he's our father and that's what takes place when you get saved saved. I received an interesting email this week. Somebody wrote me and said, Pastor David, I'd like to share something with you. He said, um, about 16 years ago, he says, I was driving in my car and I turned on the radio 
And it just so happened, the voice over the radio said, do you know God? And he said, so I answered that voice. I said, of course I know God. He said, and I got angry, and I even turned the radio off. How dare that guy ask me if I know God? He said, so I turned the radio off. He said, and I began to think. He said, you see, he says, I was raised in the Catholic Church. He says, I, I went to Catholic elementary school, junior high school. He says, I wanted to go to Catholic high school. I wasn't able to, to get in. But he said, I, I remained a very strong Catholic. He said, I, I, I had, I had a, a belief that I knew God. He said, and, and he said, and, and, and I went through my early formative years like that. And so when I'm listening to you, he said, ask that question, um, do you know God? He said, I got angry and I turned the radio off and I said, how dare you ask me if I know God? Of course I know God. He said, but at the same time, there was an emptiness in my heart. He said, and, and, I, and I didn't know exactly how to fill it. So what I was doing is I was very active in my church. He said, I lived in Chino Hills and he says, and I was serving at the Catholic Church and he said, and, and I, I started having this aching and, and all and so he said, I went and I spoke to my priest and and the priest said, oh, don't worry about it. Keep serving and keep coming to church. He said, and that's what I did. But there was something inside of me, an emptiness, he said. And so what did I do? He said, I turned the radio back on. He said, and I'm driving again one day, and I turned the radio back on to here. And he said, and then you said it again. Do you know God? He says, I've already answered that question. He said, and then you said this. Do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? He said, that stopped me in my tracks. He says, because I had never considered that I should have a real... He said, and I, I said, no, I don't. I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I was so filled with trying to do things to please him that I never even got to know him. And so I waited to the end of the program. I heard the conclusion, found that you were in our area. He says, and I came that Wednesday night. He said, and on Wednesday night, 16 years ago, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. He says, and I wanted to tell you that I've been serving the Lord as a missionary in China now for many years. I'm on furlough. I'm, he lives in Orange County. He's in Orange County with uh, family. He says, I'm in Orange County right now with my family, and I just wanted you to know that I committed my heart to Christ 16 years ago at church, but now I'm serving full-time and have done so for many years in China, bringing the same message to people, asking the same question, not just, do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Because there are a lot of people, if you ask them, do you know God? They'll say, oh, of course I know God. But if you ask them, are you saved? When you die, are you going to go to heaven? How do you know you're going to go to heaven? If Jesus were to ask you the question, why should I let you into my kingdom, what would your answer be? Would it be because you go to church? Would it be because you were water baptized? Would it be because you try to be a good person? Would it be because you serve or you give? What would your answer be? Because if I gave any any answer outside of because I received you as Lord and Savior, because I put my faith and trust in you, and I have a relationship with you of faith because I know who you are and I invited you into my life, then I'm just religious. And what he's saying here is, listen, he's saying, I gave to your family the privilege and the honor of being my priests to be taken out of bondage into a relationship with me that was an honor that you don't deserve, but you don't care about that. It didn't matter to you at all. It doesn't matter to you at all. In verse 28, he says, Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? When he says to wear an ephod, an ephod is a priestly garment. It's like a robe. And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Not only did I give you the joy of freedom, but I provided for you generously. This nation gave large amounts of sacrifice, and the priests were received from that sacrifice, a portion of it, and therefore they had become wealthy, and they were of high rank within the nation of Israel. So he's saying, I have blessed your life. I have given to you a prestige, and I have honored you with prosperity, and it doesn't matter to you. Now in 2 Corinthians, in the New Testament, chapter 8, verse 9, Paul said, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 
And I've heard people say, see, that means that we're all supposed to be millionaires because we're Christians. Is that what he's talking about? No. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he, he tells us what the riches of Christ are. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. God has given to us peace and joy and love. God has given to us the graces of his spirit. God has made us rich in Jesus Christ. But again, some people don't care. It doesn't matter. He's saying to Eli, your family was cared for. You received honor, you received uh, wealth, and you received uh, a variety of blessings from me simply because I chose you out of bondage. But it doesn't matter. Notice verse 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? When he says, why do you kick at, the term kick at refers to rejecting <clears throat> the yoke. They tried to get rid of God's authority over them, in other words. Why have you treated my ordinances, which have provided blessings for you, as a burden to you? Why have you done that? You see, they enjoyed the benefits, but they rejected God's authority over them. So he goes on in verse 30, and he says this, Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, in Israel, the priesthood was derived from Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest. Aaron's family line was broken over time into various lines of descent. So there are various families that are all looking back to Aaron as the first priest, but their family line is broken down. So there are other family lines that all derive their origin from Aaron. I was sharing in second service to try and make this seem practical. It's kind of like this. My last name obviously comes from my father. My father receives his last name from his father. Now, my father's father, my grandfather, his last name was Rosales. His wife, my grandmother's last name was Corona. My mother, well, her father's last name was Salse. My mother's mother's last name was Alba. And so you have, as you have, four houses that combine into the one house. And so that one house is the line of Rosales. That's my line. But I have cousins who have different last names. And these are like Sanchez's and others. They're, they have last names that are different, but they're my blood still, but a different line of descent. And that's how it worked in the time of Israel. You have Aaron, the high priest, who has sons who have lineages that are derived. So what you have is Eli. You have Eli coming from a certain lineage all the way back, though, to the high priest Aaron. What God does is he removes from Eli the high priesthood and he gives it to another line, another family member that is of a different descent. It all goes back to Aaron, but it will never again be enjoyed by Aaron, uh, rather by uh, Eli and his family. So God is saying, your descendants will no longer hold this high position. Now notice in verse 30 how he says, those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Your family has not honored me, I will not honor you. You have kicked against my ordinances, you don't understand that you at one time were in bondage and I set you free. You've disregarded the value of the priesthood and how I blessed you. You have honored your sons over me because you know what my word says concerning my sanctuary and how things ought to be done. But because you didn't want to deal with your sons who were in sin, you allowed people in Israel to no longer want to bring sacrifice. You have known, but you haven't done and because you've known and not done, I will hold you accountable for that. In James chapter 1, verse 22, James says it this way. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It's easy for us to have a Bible study, to hear the things that are said, 
to walk out saying, I've been equipped, but not to do a single thing. And so God says, you need to be somebody who understands and does. So, he continues in verse 31, Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. So his result, the result of him not dealing with the sin is to see his house fall. When he says, The days are coming that I'll cut off your arm, to cut off the arm is a picture of cutting off his and his family's strength. The arm represents strength. In Psalm 37, 17, the arms of the wicked shall be broken. The Lord upholds the righteous. So he's saying, I'm going to deal with you and your sons and your house is going to fall. In verse 32, he says, you'll see an enemy in my dwelling place. Despite all the good which God does for Israel, there shall not be an old man in your house forever. And so when he says, you'll see an enemy in my dwelling place, that dwelling place is the tabernacle. It's where God meets with the people. The enemy speaks of the calamity that he's going to see when he sees the defeat of the Jews. He sees the capture of the ark. He sees the death of his sons and the triumph of the Philistines. You're going to see this, but not only that, but I want to point something out in verse 32 when he says, there shall not be an old man in your house forever. Now, what does that mean? Older men represent wisdom that comes with age and experience. We have a hard time today understanding that. Because my generation doesn't want to grow old. We don't want to grow old. You know, I was talking to one of the ladies in our fellowship this morning in the first service, and she's a doll. I mean, she's very sweet to me, and she's, she's old enough to be my, my mom. She's my mom's age. And, and as I was speaking to her and all, I was sharing with her, and I said, I, wanted, I said, you know something that I think? She says, what's that? And I said, my dad, when he was my age, when my dad was 58, my dad is, was older than I am at 58. I said, does that make sense to you? And she goes, no, you stupid child. No, she said, yes. She says, that makes sense to me. I said, you know what I mean? When my dad was 58, he was older than I am at 58. Because my dad came from a generation that worked hard, scraped for everything they had, my dad was just of that generation, and, and they ended up giving to me things that they themselves lacked, so I didn't gain experience like my dad. My dad was working and when he was like 13 years old. My dad was already working, 14 years old. My grandmother, his, you know, his, his mama, my grandmother gave birth to one of, his, one of his brothers, and the same day that she gave birth was in a field working, that was my grandmother. The day she gave birth, she was in a field working. She had just given birth to one of my uncles, and there she is working. That's how their generations were. Ours is entirely different. And so I, I realize that people my age don't want to even admit that they're my age. That blows my mind. I mean, you have people say they're 50-something. Something what? What do you mean 50-something? Come on now. What's this all about? I'm 30-something. Now, you're 30 immature. Why don't you just say, I'm 35? But we don't do that. Why? We don't want to admit it, now do we? We don't want to say how old we are. Why? Because people are going to be shocked. I'm, I'm 38. <gasps> like I care. But we do that, don't we? We do. We don't want to grow older. And here's the problem. When you refuse to grow wisdom and it, it, you refuse to grow older, you refuse to have wisdom because wisdom normally comes with age and experience. And what happens is we're too busy trying to be cool and young and we stop being examples and mentors to those who really do need our advice because a lot of young people already think they know more than we do. They, they think that when they were born, they know more than we they, my kids are that way. I'm sure my grandson's going to be that way. They just have this idea that they already know more than you. It's kind of like Mark Twain when he said, when I was 17, my father, I thought my father was, 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 was stupid. And he says, but when I turned 21, I was amazed at how much the old man had learned in four short years. <laughs> what happens is, is we, when we're young, think we know it all, but that's why we need those who are older 
because they can say been there done that do this you will live I wanted my kids to have a different testimony than me because I did not want my kids to go through what I went through to learn the things that I have learned I wanted them to bypass that because there's a way that they can do that by simply listening to the one who's gone before them someone was telling me not that long ago about an older woman who was there with her her daughter her daughter's in her early 30s and this older woman is telling this friend of mine how that she and her daughter go out to the clubs together clubbing now this woman's in her 50s and I'm thinking it's dark in there isn't it cuz you come out into the light baby I don't care how much spackle you put on that face <laughs> it's an old face I mean can you grow up sometime can you wake up and realize your daughter doesn't need a play friend she needs a mom she needs someone with maturity and experience some wisdom to help her because she's making bad decisions but if you become her club buddy what are you trying to do and what are you showing her what are you teaching her and how is she going to respect you she's not going to and we have to understand that you see this phrase here there shall not be an old man in your house is another way of saying your house lacks wisdom because wisdom comes from time and experience in Job chapter 12 verse 12 wisdom is with aged men and with length of days understanding and so the point he's making is your house will lack a wise man to lead you back to God's blessings. In verse 33, he says, But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Your younger men are going to cause heartbreak. They will not die peacefully. They will meet an untimely and violent death. In verse 34, he says, now, this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day, they shall die, both of them. And so he's saying, this is what's going to validate this. And this does occur, by the way. We'll see this in chapter 4 when we arrive there. But he goes on in verse 35 and he says, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house. He shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. Though Eli and his family will no longer hold the office of high priest, the priesthood will remain. He's saying that he will raise up someone who will faithfully do his will. This reminds me of something, a very brief thing here, but it reminds me of something. It reminds me that no one is indispensable. No one is indispensable. God will use whomever is ready and whomever is available. We need to be prepared that we might be used by him and we should be prepared at all times. In Isaiah, in chapter 6, Isaiah says he saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. The train filled the temple. He says, I saw the seraphim and they were crying out, holy, holy, holy. He says, I, I realize that I'm a, 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 an unclean man dwelling uh, amongst the people who are also unclean. And, and yet I heard a voice and the voice spoke and, and it said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And, and then I said, here am I, send me. You know, I became aware of myself and, and I realized that God wants to use somebody. So I said, God, I, I've seen your holiness and, I, and, I, and I'm enjoying your presence and, and now I want to be used by you. God will use you if you're open to it. And, and, and yet on the one hand, we're not indispensable, but on the other hand, he will use us if we're in the place to be used. I've said this to you before. It bears repetition at this point here. Some of you have never heard this particular story. Others have. Bear with me if you've already heard this. I was about 24 years old. I had been saved now for around four years. Spent my time in the military, gotten out, started going to school. Before I got saved, I used to like to drink and party and do all of that. I especially had an alcohol problem. 
consider myself to be an alcoholic because I wasn't somebody who could drink a beer. I drank a six-pack and then I went and bought another one. That's how I drank. I didn't drink just a glass of wine. I drank the bottle of wine. I didn't drink for the taste. I drank for the buzz. And that's how I was. And every time I drank, I got drunk. I did not drink in any other way other than to be drunk. And that's how I was for a long time. So I got saved. When I got saved, God started doing some cleaning up in my life. And one of the things that I no longer really needed was alcohol. And I had stopped drinking and and yet, I was also saying, you know, a beer here and there isn't going to kill me. And one day I was with a friend of mine, and we were in one of the beach cities, and we went into a pizza parlor, and while we were there, I was seated at this table, and, and my friend was facing me, and, and we were ordering some pizza, and he said to me, you know what would go good with, with this pizza is, is a beer. So I said, well, if you want, you know, go ahead, get it. So he got a pitcher. And they bring the pitcher and they put it in front of us and I took my glass and I poured a glass of beer. I hadn't really had any of it. I just put it in front of me. As I put this beer in front of me, I see an old man, old to me. I was 24. This older man was probably in his 70s and he came walking in, in and he sat directly across from me. My table is, I'm sitting behind my table facing my friend and now facing this man who's in my direction and he's only within 10 feet of me or so. So, as he sits there, I look at him, his shoulders are slumped. I, I still remember some of this. His shoulders were slumped and he was looking at his hands there when he was ordering. And you could see that the weight of the world was on this poor man. And as I was looking at him, I sensed the Lord speak to my heart saying, share my love with him. Share my love with him. And I looked at him and I looked down and I looked at the beer that was in front of me. The picture was directly in front of me. And I remember thinking this as I heard the voice in my heart say, share my love with him. I remember saying, I can't because I have beer in front of me and he won't listen to me. I remember saying that. I can't. I have beer in front of me. He won't listen to me. And as I was saying that, no, I actually remember saying, no, I can't. And this is before the Lord. This is before God and his witnesses. This is the truth. When I said, no, I can't because I have beer in front of me, two young men walked in off the street there and one sat on one side, the other sat on the other. And the man sitting on the man's right side, my left, the man pulled out a Bible and started telling this man, I was there, I saw it, I'm right 10 feet away. And he started saying, do you know that God loves you? I heard him. And I remember looking at that beer and looking at that pizza. And the voice of the Lord spoke to me and I have never forgotten it. I have never forgotten it. The voice of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, if I can't use you, I will use somebody else. I have never forgotten that. Is that beer worth it? Now, I have people right now who are thinking, I can drink beer if I want. Uh, that's between you, your conscience, and your God. I am not saying that. You're not hearing me. Can you effectively serve God when you're a stumbling block, stumbling block to others? And the answer is no, you cannot. You can't. I made a decision a long time ago with my liberties and freedoms to put them under the blood of Christ so I could be used by God. Because I know nobody's indispensable. I know that. I know that if God can't use me, he'll use somebody else. But I want to be Isaiah. I want to say, here am I. Send me. I want to be used. Well, are you willing to stop drinking your bud? Yeah. Who cares? You gave me new wine, Lord. I don't need beer anyway. You gave me something beyond that. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because some people don't. Because some people, the minute you say, you know, this is what happened, I get letters from people. I can drink if I want to. Nowhere does it say I can't. Really, what kind of ministry do you have? Tell me about it. I'd like to hear. How effective are you? Well, my friends, when we're drinking our beer, we talk about Jesus. That's about it, right? That's your fellowship, right? Beer and pizza. You missed the point. Is that your communion elements? I use grape and I use a cracker. You use beer and pizza. Are you having communion? As far as I'm concerned, I want to be used by God. And there are things that I will voluntarily not do, though people will argue with me and they do. 
They're missing the point. The point I'm saying is this. No one's indispensable. There needs to be something about your life that makes you capable of sharing. It isn't legalism when you choose out of love's sake to let things go that you don't need and in order that you can bring something that people need. You can bring that and deliver it to them so that they might hear that God cares about them. Eli was being removed because Eli honored his sons more than he honored his God. And God said, you can't do that. God said, you cannot honor your kids more than you honor me. I'm going to remove you. And by the way, I'm going to raise up a faithful priest. During the reign of King David, a man by the name of Zadok becomes the priest that is raised up that would fulfill that. And what is interesting is Zadok's priestly line is mentioned in the prophetic book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 44, verse 15, in reference to them serving in the millennial reign of the anointed, the Messiah. And you see that in Ezekiel 44, 15, where it says, The priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord. This occurs in the millennial reign of Christ. And so they continue to minister. And he goes on to say in verse 36, It shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. That's the punishment that they receive for their sin and the punishment fits the sin. In other words, you who gorged yourselves on the sacrifices are going to end up begging. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that also shall he reap. If you sow to the flesh, from the flesh you reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit you reap everlasting life, Paul said in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. And so the punishment fits the crime. Eli, you did not obey. You did not follow. You honored man more than God. I'm removing the priesthood from you. I will give it to a faithful priest who will continue to do so. You didn't care others will. I will use the ones who care. Now for me, I read the scriptures with a heart of application and so I'm constantly saying, Lord, whatever it is that you want to remove from me, I want that removed so I can be used by you. I want to be used by you because there's no greater joy than to be used by God. God moving in your life, blessing your life. There's no greater joy than that. So, Lord, as I read this, I want to honor you. And I want to thank you. You took me out of bondage. I thank you. Lord, you have blessed my life. I thank you. Lord, you say I should honor you even more than I honor my kids, meaning I should put you first and then care for them according to your word. I want to do that. Lord, I want to be used by you because there's no greater blessing than to be used by you. I realize that no one's indispensable. I know that you could get somebody else that you could use, but Lord, here am I. Use me. And I want to be in that position. And I pray that we as the church have that heart in us too, to be used by the Lord. Our Father, we ask that you would work in us today. I ask that you'd continue to reveal yourself, Lord, in our lives. We want to be used by you. And, and we take these stories, Lord, and, and we look for application. And so we ask that you would work in us, Lord. And we see Eli, a man who as he grew older, I'm certain, wanted to serve you, Lord. But at the same time, he never really dealt with the issues that needed to be dealt with. And he ultimately reaped what was sown. Father, I ask that we would be those who sow to the Spirit, that from the Spirit we'll reap life. I lift up this congregation. I pray for us, Lord, that we would love you and serve you and be in the place that we can be used by you, Lord. So work in us and continue to show yourself to us, Lord. And, and may we take those liberties that you have given to us and may we, may we live those liberties out loving others and loving you first, Lord. So we lift all of these things to you now and we pray that you would work in us, Lord, that we might bring glory to Jesus Christ. 
even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed perhaps I have some who need to get right with the Lord right now right where you're at if you know the Spirit of God is speaking to you that you need to get right with him I want to pray for you right now and if you need to would you raise your hand let me pray for you right where you're at father you see these hands and you know the reason why they're being raised to you right now and I'm asking in Jesus name that you would reach down and you would touch these lives their hearts are opening to you right now father I'm asking that you would fill their hearts as you have cleansed them fill them Lord with your spirit with your presence and from this day on Lord may they be used by you to glorify you Lord I ask that you make them brand new from this moment Lord even as their hearts are opening to you wash them and cleanse them fill them and use them for your glory from now until forever Lord and we give you praise for this and thank you Lord we bless you thank you Lord you can put your hands down and Jesus please keep working in us and working on us that we might be those that really are a kingdom of priests Lord a holy nation that we have been called out to be used by you to bring glory to you in your name we pray amen let's all stand we'll close with a word of prayer and a song you know we do have our ministry fair outside you might want to look at it we have our evening service tonight men I invite you to be with us next Saturday I encourage you to to come and be with us and let's see what the Lord wants to do in us if we just open our hearts to him let's see what he wants to do Father, I ask that you use us to your glory. We leave this place now into a mission field. May we be found faithful as we serve you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.